little round top. Uh, Avalon Hill Game Company, 1982 version. Command and Control. Uh, first Command and Control during the um, the fight on Little Round Top. In general terms, the command and control of Hood's right flank disintegrated as the advance and attacks progressed. First to go was Hood, who was wounded in the arm early in the action. Senior brigade commander was Law, who had by then advanced with his brigade, so there was some delay uh, in informing him of his new responsibilities. The senior regimental commander in Law's brigade was Colonel James L. Sheffield of the 48th Alabama. This regiment was soon to be hotly engaged and Sheffield fully committed to controlling it. There is no evidence that Law specifically informed Sheffield of his new duties and none that he was ever able to exercise them during the fighting. Only afterward in, in the report of Major uh, James M. Campbell, then commanding the 47th Alabama, okay, then commanding, let's take a look, for 47th Alabama, on the front is Lieutenant Colonel Bulger, Bulger, Bul Bulger, yeah, Bulger, there he is, Major Campbell, 47th Alabama, that's who we're talking about. So only afterward in the report of Major James M. Campbell, then commanding the 47th Alabama, was Sheffield mentioned as the brigade commander. Campbell wrote, quote, After the f firing ceased, in obedience to orders from Colonel Sheffield, commanding the brigade, I threw my regiment out as skirmishers on the right. Okay. The other command problem was Colonel James W. Jackson, commanding the 47th Alabama. There is little doubt that he, and possibly his adjutant, was not present during the fight for Little Round Top and that the command was assumed by Lieutenant Colonel, again, Michael J. Bulger, an elderly gentleman of over 60. When he was wounded, Major Campbell took over. In his report, Campbell did not mince his words, quote, there was some confusion in these companies, the seven involved in the fighting. And what do you know? What do you know? We have... <laughs> we have seven companies in the countermix for this for the 47th Alabama so here are the seven seven companies so there was some confusion in these companies the seven involved in the fighting owing to the fact that in the charge the lieutenant colonel expected the colonel to give all the necessary commands and the colonel remained so far behind that his presence on the field was but a tremble on the lieutenant colonel According to Jackson, he was in the thick of the fight, but this is highly unlikely. He resigned from the army shortly afterwards and died aged 35 on July 1st, 1865, so it is possible that ill health was the cause of his poor performance at Gettysburg. Let's see. Um, 44th. 44th is not part of our game here. Um... The attack was further divided when Colonel Oates, with the 47th and his own 15th Alabama, climbed to the summit of Round Top, while the other three of his own uh, on his left, the other three on his left, remained on the lower slopes and attacked first. The overall effect was that the attacks on Little Round Top were the result of the initiatives of the various regimental commanders from two brigades conducted without coordination at higher level. The infantry. Um, this game, Little Round Top, is primarily an infantry game. Uh, actually, I would say almost exclusively. It's it's infantry and commanders. Um, yeah. Now, Gettysburg. Gettysburg was an infantry battle. Artillery played its part on the main battlefield on all three days, but Union cavalry was in action only on July 1, mostly dismounted. The cavalry clashes, and there were plenty, mostly occurring during the Confederate advance north and the subsequent withdrawal south. There were three significant mounted actions during the battle on July 3rd, but they were either peripheral or several miles from the decisive field of action. Only infantry can take and hold ground for any length of time. This is still true today. As they were by uh, far the most numerous component of both armies at Gettysburg, it was the infantry that inflicted and received the great majority of casualties. Despite the huge amounts of artillery ammunition expended, it was the rifled rifle musket bullet that inflicted 90% of all losses on the Gettysburg battlefield. 
Artillery fire was responsible for some 9%, and bayonets, clubbed rifles, and swords the remaining 1%. The struggle at Gettysburg saw three days of Confederate infantry attacks on defending Union infantry, albeit with considerable artillery support for both armies, but the object of the fighting was for infantry to close with the enemy, drive him from his position, in this case Cemetery Ridge, and hopefully destroy him as a fighting force. At Gettysburg, it was the muzzle-loading single-shot rifle musket that dominated the battlefield. Most infantrymen on both sides carried one of several varieties of this weapon. With the U.S. manufactured Springfield in his hands, the average soldier felt he had the best weapon readily available at the time, with the British Enfield, preferred by some, coming a close second. The Confederates, using captured machinery, made an excellent copy of the U.S. Model 1855 rifle musket firing the .58 Mini bullet called the Richmond Rifle. The infantry also had a number of breech loaders, sharps, and the cavalry breech loading carbines, sharps and burnsides, and repeaters, spencers, on the battlefield. However, these significant technical developments, particularly the latter, which would soon change battlefield tactics forever, had been rejected as insufficiently tested by Brigadier General James W. Ripley, the Union Chief of Ordnance. Ripley had the chance at the start of the war to authorize the large-scale production and purchase of breech-loading single-shot rifles for standard issue. He failed to do so. Instead, he went ahead with the tried and tested, but now somewhat outmoded Springfield. This decision was not without its support at the time, as the consensus of expert opinion inclined toward the use of the muzzle loader and the repeaters of the day were considered especially undesirable for military purposes. It was said that those already in use were complicated in their mechanism, liable to malfunction, difficult to repair, and got through ammunition so rapidly that supplies were soon exhausted. All right, so game rules. Uh, let's take a look at command um, officers and command points. The importance of leadership in battle is represented by the command points given to the officers of each regiment. All formation changes, movement, volley fire, and melee attacks require the expenditure of command points. Officers may only influence companies of their own regiment. They have absolutely no effect on companies of other regiments. A company may only receive command points from a single officer during a game turn. Companies that receive no command points may not perform any of the functions listed on the command point cost chart. They may fire, however. So fire does not fire is not connected to command point expenditure or availability at all. Command. Uh, officers have two leadership ratings. The officer's command point total and his command radius. So looking at Colonel Oates, Confederate commander here, he has a command point uh, total of 25 and a command radius of 6. Colonel Oates, 15th Alabama. Um, command point total. Each officer may expand command points for any of the functions listed on the command point cost chart. So these include... These include, so a quick review of the uh, command point cost chart. Um, this is on the map. Underneath the terrain key is above, is above this point, uh, this uh, command point cost chart, and above that's the uh, turn track. Uh, so we have a table here. There's what, two, four, six, eight, 10, 13, 14 different uh, functions, 14. Yeah, but these take into account different, like changing levels and terrain is integrated into it. But we have cost and command points for infantry company in line versus column and then officer. So officer is easy. Pretty much everything is one or two or or, or not applicable. Okay. But uh, for the rest of them, we have move one hex forward, same level. So in this game... So in this game... Uh, we, uh, what is what is important for this design is uh, we have three front hexes, three uh, rear hexes, and what's critical is the center front hex and the center rear hex. So we have a front hex, center front hex, front hex, rear hex, center rear hex, and rear hex. Um, so move one hex forward, same level. This is obviously same level. This is level one. So that uh, the unit is in line it would spend three or three command points would have to be spent for that. If it were in, if it were in column, um, it would spend two to move forward into the uh, 
I move one hex forward, same level. Move one hex forward, change level. Um, is, is it adding one for, to both costs? Um, moving one hex backwards, same level. Is prohibiting column, makes sense. And is um, four, uh, four command points for infantry in line. Move one hex backwards, change a level. Is 50% more at six. Still prohibited, obviously, in column. Move one hex forward into rocky hex, same level. Um, and then have an asterisk here. Companies can't move backwards into a rocky hex. Okay. Um, five. So one more than one more than moving one hex forward, changing a level. Um, yeah. Move one hex forward into a rocky hex and change level. Let's see, that's the maximum cost on the table for infantry in line at six. Uh, cross stone wall, rock, or fence. Hex side, plus one for both formations. Change facing more than one hex side. Okay, changing. Change facing more than one hex side. Okay, the effects of uh, facing on movement. A company may only uh, move into its center front hex if moving forward or its center rear hex if moving backward. Companies may therefore have to adjust their facing, turning in other words, when moving from hex to hex. As long as a company is within the command radius of an officer of its regiment, it may always turn one hex in each hex at no cost. There it is. If a company wishes to turn more than one hex side, at a he a hex side in a hex, it may do so at the cost of two command points, which does correspond to our, our table. In most cases, units may only change their facing during a friendly movement phase. However, units may rearrange their facing after participating in a melee combat or conducting a retreat and must change their facing in order to perform required retreats. Okay. And then we have change formation, five and five, uh, change order of stacking, two and two, so stacking is basically, as far as I can tell, two companies. Stacking units may never move through enemy units, nor may they stack with enemy units except to engage in melee. Terrain has no effect on stacking. That's good because there's a lot of uh, close terrain here. Units of different regiments may not stack together. All right, so basically when two units. Um, Where's the basic? Where is the basic? Um, okay, there may be no more than two friendly companies in a hex at the end of any phase. Of course, leaders and markers don't count. So you can have two, two units in a hex stacked in a hex like that. They have to have the same facing. The unit on top, so alpha company in this case, um, only the top company in a hex may engage in fire. The bottom unit may not fire, either offensively or defensively. There is an exception, uh, 10.3, which is volley fire. Okay, yeah. Yeah, volley fire is, an, is a direct exception to this, allowing two companies stacked together to fire together. Um, normally only the top unit in the hex takes losses when fired on. Oh, there we go. When two units are stacked together, the top company is considered to be in front on the line with the second company behind it in support. So in this case, Alpha Company is on the line, Bravo Company is in support, or to spend uh, two points, they're in line formation, they can switch their order, which is to move B forward and, and Alpha back, A back, A Company back. Perform volley fire, four, prohibited, in column, that makes sense. Uh, units in column don't fire at all. All companies that are not out of ammunition may fire their weapons at enemy units that are within range and line of sight. Um, there is both offensive and defensive fire during each player turn, giving each side the opportunity to fire at least once. Fire comment is resolved in the fire combat results table. Where is it? Um, companies may only fire through their frontal hex sides and units in column formation. There we go. Units in column formation, out of ammunition, or with fixed bayonets may not fire at all. And then we have initiate melee, same 
cost is performing volley fire, four and prohibited. Uh, remove and fix bayonets, five and five, same as changing formation. And rally, five and five. Okay. Um, hmm. 